you, I do too. Okay, go ahead and start your equipment. <clears throat> if I was smart, I'd have done one more scripture there and we'd have been through with Matthew, but I didn't notice. So we're in Matthew 26 and verse 29. <clears throat> um, Matthew 26 and verse 29. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. All right. <clears throat> Anybody ever wondered what that scripture's from? Um. <clears throat> What is he talking about? I mean, look at it and go, okay, well, this is what it's talking about. It's talking about having communion in the kingdom. Having communion in the kingdom. Um, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of this vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my in my father's kingdom. <clears throat> um, kingdom uh, fellowship or communion is on the basis of the lamb. It's on the basis of self-giving. It's on the basis of broken bread. Communion is on the basis of broken bread. Jesus said, took the bread and he said, this is my body. He took it. He broke it. This is my body. The broken bread is my body. The giving of it. And, and what did he do? Then he gave it. Okay? This is my blood. Drink ye. This is my poured out blood. He didn't just go, look, I'm going to get a, uh, what do you call it when you, uh, transfusion. I'm going to go get a transfusion, and I'm going to give you all, all a little drink. It was... Blood that was poured out in death on the cross is what it represents. It represents not just blood, not just blood in general. Oh, that's, you know, uh, uh, he gives us his life, but his life is poured out. Life is in the blood. His life was poured out. It didn't remain life in him. It was poured out so that it could be poured into others and they could have life didn't just pump through his veins and say the life is in the blood and as long as I got blood in me I'm alive no I give myself so that others may have life <clears throat> and so uh, I wrote communion with God is those who fellowship who eat of the crucified lamb that's communion that's eating with him in the kingdom that's a fellowship around the broken lamb, the selfless lamb. And that's what all, that's what the father is eating and that's what we're eating with him and that's what we're fellowshipping over. All right. <clears throat> um, so let's go to the book of Mark, which is only a few pages over. And we're going to start with chapter four. <clears throat> And just a reminder, what we're doing is we're going through and we're looking at scriptures that have to do with the kingdom. And we're noticing, first of all, one of the first things we're noticing that we brought up in the very beginning of this course is <clears throat> that the gospels are way more about the kingdom than they are about trying to get people saved in the sense of preaching a salvation message and then praying and then that's it. Gospels... The, the writers of the Gospels are given many opportunities to express the saving Gospel, and they don't do it. I mean, um, you know, in the very beginning, first one or two classes, we pointed out several scriptures um, that uh, could help with that, uh, that, that almost say it, 
But then when you read it, you realize if you didn't already know the gospel, you wouldn't have read that into it necessarily. You wouldn't have gotten that, you know. <clears throat> um, and we've concluded that that's because if they really wanted to just lay out the gospel, and let's face it, John, the gospel of John does a wonderful job, but for sure the synoptic gospels really don't give it any effort on that front. But, but if you'll notice, we've been just going through and hitting the word kingdom over and over and over, right? It's just, it's so prevalent. And that's because ultimately <coughs> saved people are supposed to, I'll say it like this, are supposed to allow the kingdom to enter into them. Or we can say it a, a more familiar way, Christ to be formed in them. Not just saving atoms, you know, the atom nature. Not just saving the flesh, and, but leaving it flesh. But his ultimate end is seen in the kingdom. And uh, so, <clears throat> so we've been just taking the time to go through and to look verse by verse, not in a row, but I mean just going through and seeing how many verses mention the kingdom and then what is the context around them? Just like that last one, you know, um, talking about um, I'm not going to have communion until we have it together in the, in the kingdom. Because it, you could almost say in a sense, I, bec I can hear, you know, maybe Jesus saying, uh, because I didn't have communion with you on that first Lord's Supper because you weren't of it. You you needed to eat it then and become it. <clears throat> and so um, so we're in Mark chapter 4 and we're going to look at verse 30 through 32. Mark 4, 30. And he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what comparison shall we compare it it is like a grain of mustard seed y'all remember this when we started it you can't miss this one it is like a grain of mustard seed which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that are in the earth but when it is sown when it is sown it groweth up and becometh great becometh greater becometh great greater than all the herbs, and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. All right. So w what will you like in the kingdom of compare it? Can you compare it to a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds? It is the least. It is less. It, and, and that's what Jesus was. But... But let's consider, he wasn't least in the fact that he was God. He was greater, right? He was God and he was greater. But he humbled himself and came in the form of a man and then was seen in the form of a servant and then was seen in the form of a criminal and died. He became less. It's called kenosis. He poured himself out. He poured his greatnesses out and became less than the least and in that form was sown, not in his greatness form. He didn't appear as God and appear in the fullness of God and, you know, radiate and everything, but then all of a sudden people just jumped on him and, and put out his light and killed him. And in, in the gloriousness of God, he was crucified. He poured himself out before he was crucified. And that's, that's, that's what the incarnation represents. That's what Philippians is addressing. He was in the form of God, thought it not a thing to be grasped after to be equal with God. But was made in the fashion of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. I mean, that's one humbling to come from God to man. That's the incarnation. It's another humbling to come from man to servant. You know, washing the disciples' feet, serving others. It's another humbling. It's another 
depth of humbling to go from servant to humbling yourself unto that kind of death, a criminal's death. What shall we like in the kingdom? It's like the seed that's the least that is sown. There's not just a little seed going, well, this is the greatest. And that's what Jesus said. They said, look, you know, Lord, let us sit on your right hand or your left or whatever. <clears throat> we think that the Lord, like, hates uh, greatness or, or ri being rich or that sort of thing. No, he doesn't hate that. He doesn't hate it at all. He sees it as an opportunity to manifest his nature by pouring it out for others. It is those, you know, like Jesus. I mean, he was God and he poured it out. You know, anybody can be beat down and then humble themselves. You know what I mean? Someone can have a bad self-image and then they walk around humble. But that's not Jesus. It's when you could handle the situation maybe better than everybody and you don't say a word, you just bow and, and maybe even appear as an idiot because you didn't say anything. And I mean, you know, you have to hear from the Lord on these things, but I'm just telling you, you know, I'm, I'm telling you there's a spirit. That is, that's the key. It's not just a matter of humbling yourself either. It is a matter of Christ. And that's where your heart is to seek. You don't seek some principles of, of uh, sacrificial living. <laughs> monks do that or, or, or Tibetan monks or whatever. And it's not Christ. The father wants his son. So again, it's like we have to continually get our compass back on the Lord. And those things will come. They will manifest. They will come out of us. If we seek Jesus. And if it's not true, then Jesus will manifest out of us the way he's supposed to anyway. You, you see what I mean? We can't go wrong by seeking Jesus. Because if everything I told you was wrong except seek Jesus, and you really got him, he's still going to manifest out of you the way that would glorify the Father. Okay, So that's why I'm always pointing to him. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, Mark 10 also, you don't have to turn there, but Mark 10 also talks about the little children that we talked about. Let's go to Mark 11. Caitlin, I'm, gl I'm glad you told me you were tired today because I am too. <laughs> Mark 11. In verse 10. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's see, am I doing that right? No, I, yes, wait a minute. What did I say? 10, 13. Let's go to 10, 13. <clears throat> um, 10, 13. No, I'm sorry. You know what? I am tired. I can't even see anymore. 11.10 was correct. Blessed be the kingdom of our Father. I thought, I thought, well, I guess I just lucked out and hit another <laughs> kingdom scripture. That's what I thought. Um, <clears throat> uh, this scripture, this is when he's coming in on the triumphal in, uh, entry into Jerusalem the week before he dies. I would love to have more time to be able to really spell this theme out. I have really dug in to the scriptures in relationship to the triumphal entry and to uh, the, the whole storyline building up to that. That when Jesus way back in the scriptures started talking about, well, I have to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. Um, 
I mean, I've intricately dug into it. And uh, at this point, all I can tell you is that the disciples really thought Jesus was going to Jerusalem to set up his kingdom. And someday when I get a chance to share, I can show you, man. I mean, it just flat out says that. Okay, and it doesn't just say it in one scripture. That's what they thought, and, that, and that's what they had spread, and everyone was ready for that. But Jesus' words from way back to when he started talking about going to Jerusalem was about the cross. And so his mindset was one of crucifixion, and their mindset is, is one of kingdom without crucifixion. Okay? Um, so I just simply wrote here, the triumphal entry to them was about a glorious kingdom, not about the crucified life. Okay, so they're talking about the kingdom, and maybe they got that from Jesus, because, you know, he mentions it quite a bit. Maybe they got that. But what kingdom was he talking about? He's talking about one where the king first gives himself, and then, you know, follow me, take up your cross and follow me, because I'm heading there now. And to find uh, yourself in the midst of people putting palm leaves down and singing Hosanna to the king and blessed is he that, you know, uh, comes in the name of the Lord. And he knows, he's looking and he goes, they don't understand me at all. And it's not just they don't understand the kingdom. They don't understand me. He said, you know, he knows. He'd already told them, folks. He didn't get to Jerusalem and they surprised him and crucified him. He predicted exactly what was going to happen. You say, well, that's because he was a prophet. Well, it's kind of the way of this selfless lamb also. You don't have to be a prophet to predict, hey, guess how you're going to end. You know, Paul, you keep this up. And they're going to cut your head off in Rome, you know. Why don't you preach something else? You don't think people said that to Paul? Why don't you preach something else, man? This is going to get you in trouble. Look, we, are, we love you. That's why we're telling you this. You just need to hear somebody else's advice to you. Okay, well, did that scenario sort of happen in the book of Acts when he said, I'm going to Jerusalem? And they said, no, you know. That's not good. They're gonna, there's bad stuff waiting for you there. And he wept before them and said, do you not think that I'm willing to go through de this, this, and death also for the Lord? Well, to him, he understood this principle, and it was like, this, what do you think? This is what we do. That's what Jesus, this is what we do. Is there one around here, you know, that I can talk to? Am I going to have to make this donkey talk again? Another donkey talk? You know, so I got some fellowship here? Because you people don't know. Because you people do not know what's going on. <clears throat> All right. Um, chapter 12 and verse 34. Twelve and verse thirty-four. When Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that dared to ask him anything. So what was this about? So verse 28, and one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceived that he had answered, let's see, uh, answered them well, ask him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus said the first of all the commandments is hear, H-E-A-R. The first of the commandments is hear, O Israel, is hear. The commandment doesn't begin with thou shalt love. The commandment begins with hear what we're talking about. And everyone 
dismisses that and they just think it's commands to, you know, to love. I mean, come on. I mean, come on. Just think about it. I mean, it's like, okay, um, I could bring two people up here, a guy and a girl on Sunday, and I say, okay, I command you to love one another. I mean, the, you know, and get married. I want you to love like that, to fall in love. Command you to love. And they go, I just ain't feeling it, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you can't command love. You can't command love in, in that sense. Love, God is love. Love is not God. The Bible does not say love is God. It says God is love. So there's a hearing that is necessary to enter into these things that Jesus is saying. Hear, O Israel. <clears throat> the Lord thy God, let's see, um, the Lord... The Lord our God is one Lord. Okay, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's three, but they're one. But they're one in the Spirit. You, that's how it starts. You know, this is the kingdom. Thou art not far from the kingdom. Remember, this is what he's, he's saying here. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. All right. Well, what about don't kill people? Mm -hmm. See, because most of them have to do with thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. But he says, look. The key to this is you have to hear. The second key is the Lord, our God, is one. And they function as one, one spirit, one mind, one essence. That's who they are and how they are. And this is the only way this is going to work for you to come into oneness with the Lord thy God. And that will result in thou shalt. You will. Oneness brings that about. Hearing brings that about. We may we just go, okay, I gotta love, okay. You know, he commanded me to love, so love, love, you know what I mean? <laughs> we we do our best and we fail. So the end of that was uh, verse thirty two, and the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said uh, the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Wow! All whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that, he answered discreetly and said, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Okay. So what are we saying here? Jesus, in this nature, this selfless nature, will go to the cross and will fulfill all sacrifice all whole burnt offerings, that they are just a type and shadow and mean nothing if you don't have that spirit. And so Jesus comes as the fulfillment, not the keeping of the law, the fulfillment of what it was all about. It's not about the law or the keeping. It's about him, and he fulfills. And when we're one, the Lord our God is one, and we're one with that, then the kingdom of God is come. That spirit will be fulfilled. What God wants will come, but it only comes by Christ. It comes by oneness, and that oneness comes by hearing. And the fruit of hearing and oneness is thou shalt, 
And that Jesus that fulfills all of that stuff is greater than any offering, any shadow offering, and all shadow offerings because it spoke of this spirit. This person, but this spirit that he wants to impart, that we become partakers of the divine nature. This fulfills it all. There is, you know, and that's what, you know, Paul got that later on in his writings. He says, he says um, uh, to love God with all your strength and everything, um, you know, all other commandments are fulfilled in that first one. Because then you won't do that because you're selfless. You, you know, I won't take my neighbor's wife not because the commandment says, don't take her, don't take it. You know, first of all, that just stirs up. If you're, if you're Adam, that just stirs you up worse. You know, the law, you know, stirs those things up. But the spirit of Christ says, no. No. And on and on, steal something. Well, no. You know, I'll give them something. I won't take from them. All right, well, the only way to understand that is by Christ. And, and people say to me, well, that's so ethereal. No, it's not. It's the living Jesus formed in us. It's not ethereal. It is difficult through the flesh. You know, in fact, it's impossible. Because, and that's what it said. With men, this is impossible. With God, it's possible. Okay? So, again... You know, when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is rent. We see his face. We're changed into the same image. There's a process, and that process involves our heart, and that process involves never giving up. It, it involves uh, um, pursuing the Lord. And, you, and someone says, okay. Someone says, well, pursuing the Lord in my own strength until I get the Lord, that sounds contrary to what you're teaching. Okay, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to remember the thing that I said when I was in Bible school. What I said was, <clears throat> I was like 22 years old, and I said, you know, I'm putting everything I can into seeking the Lord to come to a revelation of Christ. And isn't that sort of selfish because I'm focusing on getting him for me? This is what I was asking. Some, I actually was asking the Holy Spirit. I remember now. And I said, this, it seems wrong because I'm focusing. I want Jesus, but I want Jesus, you know, to change me for, for me. I said, it, it, it feels selfish. And he said to me, if it is selfish, you won't be after you see him. <laughs> and I went, good point. I'm going in. You know, I'm going in. <clears throat> um, so, what I wrote on this was when the scribe likened love to being higher than all burnt offerings and sacrifices, then Jesus tells him that he's not far from the kingdom. Love is the nature of the kingdom. All right. Well, Mark is a short book. You ready to go into Luke? Let's go to Luke 1 and verse 33. Let's see. Let's start at verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And what was the favor? What was the favor? God wants to put Jesus in you. Right? We go, I want favor with God. I want, to, I want all my bosses to like me and give me raises and put me up higher. And all. You know what I mean? We're seeking all that instead of Jesus in us. <clears throat> Sorry, I get carried away. Uh, for thou hast favor with God, verse 31, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, 
and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. All right. Notice that the verse 33 mentions the kingdom. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Glory to God. It didn't say the house of Israel. It says the house of Jacob. You say they're the same person. Well, they are, but they're not. Jacob was the one who was always manipulating and trying to work things and to get things to fall his way and to convince people of stuff that would better benefit him. He had all of these wrong motives and all of this stuff going on. That Jacob was, you know, needed to have an encounter with God where he was so crippled that he would now be a prince with God where Christ would be formed in him, in other words. <clears throat> all right. So here, the promise is to the house of Jacob. A whole house full of manipulators and, and people that are wrong and got everything wrong. But he's going to reign. The kingdom is going to reign over and in them. Amen. Over them and in them. Because that's really the, the true fulfillment of that. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. There's hope for Jacob. And so all the Jacobs look at themselves and go, well, I'm not like Israel. No, neither was Jacob. <laughs> and, and you're not either. But when the kingdom comes, of his kingdom will be no end when he begins to reign over Jacob. Jacob's not asserting himself all the time. I wrote, rule over the house of Jacob, not the house of Israel. Jacob was a flaky person that embraced that embrace Christ as his strength, as his life, as his all. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. <clears throat> uh, let's go over to chapter 11. We are running out of time fast, are we not? Yes, Luke 11. Luke 11, 2. And he said unto them, um, now the disciples are asking, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. So Jesus says, okay, I'll do that. Pray this. When you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Okay, so first thing he said was, when you pray, don't be looking at the earth. <laughs> say, Our Father, and you look up in the, as it were, heavenly places, you look away from the earth. You don't go, oh God, would you fix my car and could you help me with my finances and could you, my boss is a mess and my co-worker, he's even worse and, you know, and, and do this and, you know, and, and send me a mate and give me this and do that for me. And do. He says, look, okay, you want me to teach you to pray? First thing to do, get your eyes off yourself, the earth. Raise them up and say, our father. Not big boss man. I'm one with you. I'm of you. I'm tired of coming here, dragging all this earth crap into the throne room. Can you imagine? Littered. You know, have you ever seen a road so littered it just made you ashamed? Can you imagine the throne room, the junk we drag in there? So, oh, you know, and we've got this over here, we've got this. He's going, do you mind? You know, do you have to drag that stuff in here? <clears throat> All right. So that's how he starts. He says, when you pray, pray this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In, uh, as in heaven, so in earth. All right, so he's saying, there's, you want to you do the will of God? Yes, yeah, you know, I can see a preacher standing in front of a big congregation. Do you want to do the will of God? Yeah! Okay, well, here's how to do it. Die to yourself and let Christ live. Yeah, no, that doesn't, you know, it doesn't draw big crowds, but it makes the Father's heart 
it, it, it's the good pleasure of the Father's heart. Doesn't it say that? It gives the Father good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, little flock. This is what Jesus said to him. He didn't say, fear not, big mega flock. Well, he didn't. The wording is exact. I'm not exaggerating it. Fear not, little flock. Fear not. Don't be afraid. It gives the Father good pleasure to give you what? The kingdom. The kingdom. So, you go, well, I don't know if God wants to reveal his son in me. Trust me, he does. For him, it's like taking out the garbage and putting treasure in there. Uh, when his, you know, so we want to do the will of God, do you? Well, the only way that's going to happen is not through all the rigmarole that you try to do. Let his kingdom come. Let Christ rule by his nature in you, and then his will will be done. Because his will is not certain deeds. Listen to me carefully. His will is not this be done and that be done and this be done. His will is first Christ be formed in you and reign in you, and then his will be done by Christ. Jesus said, I do always those things that please the Father. You can be assured then. You don't even have to worry about those things. You go, well, there's a million things. How will I know? You forget it. Just let Jesus live in you. It's not that complicated. I think there's a commercial like that. Do I still have more classes after that? One more? Oh, thank God. <laughs> I'm looking at this and I'm going, I don't think I'm going to make it. Pardon? I'd just like to get through Luke. <clears throat> All right. You know, this thing that was shared in the last class about <clears throat> the shepherd. The name shepherd. I think it comes, I think it's short for sheep. She sheep herd. A sheep herder. They probably just got tired of using two words. They're Texans, you know, <laughs> shepherd, you know, instead of sheep herder. Not goat herder. And the shepherd wants to lead sheep into green pasture. And he and he wants to form us in such a manner that we will be ready for the altar. Because that's basically, if you really think about it, that's what the shepherds of Israel did. It was an agricultural nation, but they, they grew all those sheep for all the feast days and all of the daily sacrifices. You know, they had, you could say, man, you got huge flocks. And in one day, they could be decimated by the altar. You know what I mean? And so the shepherds knew, you know, all the true shepherds, and this is where you get into Ezekiel and these other ones where, woe unto you shepherds because you've led them astray, and I won't get into all that right now. But <clears throat> um, but, the, but the sheep were not just supposed to be happy sheep. They were supposed to be prepared for the altar. For the temple, for the worship, and that's how they worship, folks. That's how they worship. <clears throat> and so Jesus now, he says, okay, let's just paint it like this. It's the end of the world, and all of the nations are going to be brought forward to be judged. Let's see. Who are we going to choose? We got uh, Michael the Archangel, and he's, you know, he knows how to fight. No, let's see. We got Gabriel the Messenger Angel, and he's really good with this. No, let's see. Um, you, Shepherd, you're perfect because you'll know exactly the difference here. 
You're going to put me in charge. Yeah, I'm just trying to paint a picture. You're going to put me in charge of the whole end time dividing? Uh, the, the, the judgment? Because it is the judgment. It's the judgment of if you're going to be in the kingdom or not with him. Remember, we're just painting a picture here. So he goes, yeah, you're, you're the perfect one for this. You are. Because you intimately know the difference. You know the essence of what I'm after. Lamb, sheep. So all that chart that I drew up there, daily altar, the little things, we're we're forming ourselves to be self-protective and self-promoting or we're conforming to the image of Christ. We're we're working on the plan, whatever the plan is, either the plan of God or our plan for happiness or or to, you know, don't put no chains on me. I just want to live the way I want to live. Whatever, however you want to draw it up. But we are all working on our plan. And I don't normally do this, but I'm just going to ask you that if there's anybody that you, you feel the Lord has been just sort of talking to you through this and you'd like some quick prayer, we're not going to go long. If you want to just come up here around me and, and we'll just pray together. I'm not going to do any coercing or anything like that. Just follow what the Lord says and don't be embarrassed. And, <clears throat> you know, and those of you who may not feel led to come up here um, that are you know, you don't feel led to come forward because you're already perfectly conformed to the image of Christ. That's okay. <laughs> I, want, I want you then and therefore to pray for those who have come forward. You guys, come on in closer. <clears throat> Close for a week. Father, we love you, and we love your son, the good shepherd, the good shepherd. We want to follow him, and we know the good shepherd gives his life. We ask you to to, uh, move upon what the Holy Spirit has spoken to us this night. Father, those on Skype who feel that they have joined with us also that in this prayer, that desire to be in this prayer, to bring them in with us and to say, Father, our only hope is Christ, not Christ on a throne far away, but Christ on the throne of our heart, Christ on the throne of our lips, Christ on the throne of our attitude. We want to, Lord, whatever we've done in the past, that's past. That can be over with as we turn our heart. We we may not change in every way, but our, our goal will have changed. Our goal, our goal is to be what you want us to be by Christ, which we know to be love. What is impossible to us is not improbable or impossible to you. So we reject our minds that reject our hope. And we look Jesus into your face and we say there's hope in you. There's hope only in you, Jesus. Father, we lift up our eyes from the earth and we call you our. Hallowed be your name, not ours. And let thy kingdom come and your will finally be done on our earth as it is in Christ right now in heaven, we pray.
and let the teachings of being in Christ that have no power fall away and let newness of life fill the vacancies of those teachings. And let the hope and the faith spring forth in us to realize that it brings you good pleasure to give us the kingdom. That we are of the house of Jacob. We are failures. We are selfish. We are manipulators. We are those who try to get our way. But there's hope for us because you said the one coming is this Jesus going to reign over the house of Jacob and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so we, we quit looking at the earth. We, we've already started by lifting up our head to you out of fear. We've quit counting our failures which are past, which are which no longer count. We can start right now with a new beginning. And we want to believe you for that right now. We don't believe everything magically goes away, but we believe that if we continue in your word, we shall know the truth, and the truth will make us something. It will make us free. So we're going to continue in your word. We're going to continue up with our heart for truth. And we're going to pick ourselves up when we fail, when we release something that isn't you, if it's a day later or ten minutes later or an hour later or when we release something that's not you, we're going to pick ourselves up. We're going to dust it off of us, off of us. We're going to get back on and we're going to go for you. And we're going to say our hope is in you and we're not going to give up our hope. Thank you. And Father, some of us, we've been like prisoners that have been locked away and we've been so much of the enemy and so much of the carnal mind that we just let go of hope and we just put everything on cruise control but we don't want to do that anymore we want to find our hope again because we if there's hope we can survive where we're at and we can eventually come into a new place that hope that hope will keep us alive until a new day dawns. Yes. You said the path of the righteous is like a new day and a new dawn that starts up slowly. Just a little bit of light chasing off that dark darkness. We'll take the little light, let it, let it keep rising. Let it rise until it's brighter like a noon day. So Father, we're asking this Believing uh, in your heart for wanting to give us the kingdom, not for our ability. If you're yes. the house of Jacob, we don't go mm-hmm. with our ability. We believe in you, Jesus. We believe in you, that you want to reign over us. Yes. So we thank you. We thank you that these aren't just words. We thank you that they bring a new hope, a new ray of hope. To look to you and to and to leave the discouragement and the failures in the dungeon and look out the window and see the light of your word. Thank you for this night. Thank you for what you will do to continue to, s- to spring forth hope and spring forth love in us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. Okay, um, I think I have five minutes left. Not really. I'm going to do something here. <coughs> Whoa, I just did something I've never done on this thing before. You scared me. Well, as you can see, 
the Lord really does have our number, doesn't he? And and he's not going to give up. So don't you give up, okay? Amen. Don't give up. Father, I just pray for all on Skype and all that are here, uh, the others that didn't come forward. <clears throat> they love you. They want you. And Lord, you know them better than I know them, but I know, I know that there is a deep hunger for you. And I ask you to unfold them. Lord, that word unfold is like putting your arms around, almost like what we did up here when we stood together, but coming into a circle, it's a fold. It's unfolding, but unfolding us into a fold, a flock of sheep and lambs. Fold them in your arms, and with that, be a surety to be brought full up into your image. In Jesus' name. All right, boys and girls, we're dismissed.